This hearing will now come to order. Uh, good morning. This is the uh, first hearing of the Research and Science Education Subcommittee for the 111th Congress. And uh, as such, it's my first hearing as, as chairman. I'm very happy to have uh, Dr. Ehlers here as the uh, ranking member on the committee. Uh, we have a great interest in STEM education. Uh, it's very fitting. I have a degree in engineering. Dr. Ehlers, of course, is a uh, physicist, and uh, we are co-chairs of the STEM Ed Caucus, so I'm very happy that uh, we are holding this as our first hearing here this morning. While we often examine and discuss ways to improve STEM education in the classroom, we rarely look at the many opportunities for learning elsewhere. A great deal of learning happens throughout our lives and everyday activities from having a conversation at the family dinner table or watching a show on television to attending a summer camp at a zoo or taking a trip to a museum. Not just students, but the general public are exposed to opportunities for science learning through informal education every day. Today, we will explore the ways in which informal learning in institutions are uniquely positioned to attract and educate the public about STEM issues, as well as the role of informal institutions in contributing to and enhancing formal education in the classroom. Today, we will hear from witnesses who are engaged in informal STEM education in a range of settings and capacities. I look forward to hearing the witnesses provide insights regarding the benefits and challenges of informal STEM ed and the state of research on how students learn STEM in informal settings, as well as recommendations for moving forward. The Science and Technology Committee and our subcommittee in particular, has made STEM ed a top priority. We have heard time and again that we need more STEM educated graduates and teachers if we want to compete in the global economy of the 21st century. A 2005 National Academies report, Rising Above the Gathering Storm, recommended that the nation increase its talent pool by vastly improving K through 12 science and mathematics education. For that reason, in the last Congress, the committee developed and the President signed into law the America Competes Act, which included many provisions specifically aimed in improving STEM education in our country. Educating more highly qualified STEM teachers and enhancing the teaching skills and content knowledge of existing STEM teachers was the top recommendation of the Gathering Storm Report, which became the basis for the teacher education and professional development provisions in the Competes Act. I hope to hear today from our witnesses about the ways in which informal education institutions, such as museums, zoos, and educational media providers, can and do offer teacher training and professional development tools for our nation's STEM teachers. I'm also interested in the role of informal education in producing a more diverse pool of scientists and engineers through programs and policies that attract individuals from groups underrepresented in STEM fields. I know some of our witnesses have been engaged in programs that address this issue, and I look forward to learning more about ways in which informal STEM environments may be uniquely positioned to make STEM learning accessible and exciting to a broader demographic. I believe if we hope to promote a more scientifically literate citizenry and to attract and educate the nation's future scientists and engineers, we cannot depend upon schools alone. Instead, we should be tapping all our resources in looking at potential for learning that happens every day outside the classroom door. I want to thank all the witnesses for taking the time to appear before the committee this morning, and I look forward to your testimony. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Ehlers for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm sure we'll have uh, a lot of good opportunities to work together, and we share a great number of common interests, uh, not just including science, but also many aspects of teaching science. So I. We're going to have a good year here. I, I'm intrigued about this hearing on informal science education. I never knew the term, uh, even though that's how I learned science for the, my first 12 years of school. I had, um, as a child, I was both unfortunate and fortunate. I was unfortunate to have uh, serious enough disease I couldn't go to school, but fortunate enough that I was well enough to study at home where I actually learned more than I would have in school. Uh, don't tell that to my former teachers, but 
Uh, but uh, I would get the assignments every week, and I would plow through them. But no experiments in science. My sister, fortunately, was in a high school where they gave, uh, she was taking a science class, I think chemistry, where they gave free copies of popular science. And she brought those home, and I devoured those. And I still remember my one of my first striking uh, home experiments, which is informal science education. I lit a candle, took some bicarbonate of soda, mixed it in a glass, formed a little trough of paper, and held it near the candle and proceeded to pour nothing that you could see. And the carbon dioxide went down the trough and extinguished the candle. And that was just amazing to me that something I couldn't see, touch, feel, smell, could actually exist, could move, and could put out a fire. Uh, that's the sort of thing that uh, you never forget, particularly if you develop them yourself. And I did the same thing with uh, some of my high school work. The uh, informal science education takes place almost everywhere but in the classroom. And I was for fortunate that I had a parents who, who could answer my questions quite often or would help me find the answer. It would be more a uh, proper way of saying it. But the question is, how do we measure the results of it? How do we know what is good in formal education or not? How does it fit into the whole of educating the child about the wonders of science? And above all, how does it get them interested in science? Informal science education can take place almost everywhere uh, but in the classroom. A recent report from the National Academies on this topic highlights the difficulty in assessing the impacts of non-classroom learning on science, knowledge, attitudes, and actions. And maybe you have to wait 40 years to see whether the students learn enough science to, to get a PhD in physics and become a member of Congress. Uh, I don't know if, if I'm one of the data points on their charts or not. Clearly, formalized science, technology, engineering, and math, which we call STEM education, can only go so far. Informal experiences shape how people view science, and can help people get comfortable enough with science to spend their free time in places like parks, museums, and after-school activities. And also, a real advantage of the informal education is can get kids really excited about it as, because they are part of the discovery process, which they often are not in a traditional classroom. Informal science education has a unique platform to engage the public in science in ways that show it is not only fun, but also fundamental, fundamental to the competitiveness of our country. These opportunities also reach many students and families who may not have received a high-quality STEM education through traditional classroom experiences or who may have been turned off to science by earlier negative experiences. One challenge faced by the informal science education community and policymakers is that inherently minimally structured environments do not lend themselves to evaluation. I am particularly interested in how the federal agencies can support the necessary research and provide resources to informal practitioners about who how to develop and manage successful programs. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. I certainly appreciate your attendance here and look forward to this being another informal ex learning experience. Thank you very much. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. I'd like to uh, also welcome uh, Mr. Griffith here at, on his uh, as a freshman, uh, it's good good to have you here on this uh, on the subcommittee. Thank look you. look forward to uh, what what you add to our to our subcommittee, and I just want everyone to know that this is going to be you know this is very important issues that that we're working on here on the subcommittee. Very important for the future of our country, and um, we're open uh, to any ideas that any anyone has on this on the subcommittee for. Uh, what we might want to talk about, what we might want to work on during this, during this Congress. Now, I, at this time, I want to introduce our witnesses. Start with uh, Dr. Joan Farini Mundi, is the Director of the Division of Research and Learning in Formal and Informal Settings 
in the Education and Human Resources Directorate of the National Science Foundation. Dr. Philip Bell is a co-chair of the National Academy's report, Learning Science in Informal Environments, People, Places, and Pursuits, and a professor at the College of Education at the University of Washington, Seattle. Ms. Andrea Ingram is the Vice President of Education and Guest Experiences at the Museum of Science and Industry, Chicago. And uh, later on, I will, uh, uh, may have the opportunity to re regale everyone with um, my memories of being a kid and going to the, uh, going to the museum. Now, Mr. Robert Lippincott is a Senior Vice President for Education at the Public Broadcasting Service. And I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to talk about when watching TV when I, was, when I was not a kid, but I certainly watched a lot of PBS. And finally, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Alejandro Rahal from my district, just west of Chicago. He's a Senior Vice President of Conservation, Education, and Training at the Chicago Zoological Society, which is the organization that operates the, the Brookfield Zoo. Now, as our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes each, after which the members of the committee will have five minutes each to ask questions. And we will have time, uh, I, I'm sure, certainly during, during the questions, if there's anything that you want to add beyond your five minutes and, if, you know, time permitting, we may have time for, uh, you know, a little bit of wrap-up at, at the end. So if you could try to limit yourselves to the, uh, to the five minutes and any opening statements. Okay, so we will start with uh, Dr. Frini Mundi. Chairman Lipinski, Ranking Member Ehlers, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, I'm Joan farini Mundy, Director of the Division of Research on, formal, on Learning in Formal and Informal Settings at the National Science Foundation in the Directorate for Education and Human Resources. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about informal education in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, the STEM disciplines. Mr. Chairman, I ask that my written statements be made a part of the record, and I would like to summarize my remarks. Today, I would like to address three main areas the level and scope of NSF-funded research and development in informal science education, emerging research directions and challenges in assessment, and the significance of informal learning environments for broadening participation in the STEM disciplines. Our signature catalyst program for investment in this area is called the Informal Science Education, ISE, program, whose primary goals are to promote lifelong learning of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics by the public, and to advance the knowledge base and human capacity for improving informal STEM education. There currently are about 200 funded projects in the ISE portfolio. Roughly 35% of these awards are to institutions of higher education, and the remaining 65% are dispersed among museums, science centers, youth and community programs, and radio, television, multimedia, and web producers. The average ISE budget over the past five years has been about $62.9 million. As hosts of new scientific findings and STEM issues of importance to the public emerge daily, it is essential to have a robust body of research and evaluation that maximizes the potential impact of our investments in informal science education. We need to know much more about how to motivate and interest learners in STEM topics, about what science topics lend themselves best to learning in informal settings, about how learning in informal settings can broaden participation in STEM careers, and about how to engage citizens with the science that affects public policy as well as their daily lives. The recent study, Learning Science in Informal Environments, the report of the National Research Council of the National Academies, was funded by the ISE program. It provides a synthesis of the research literature on learning in informal environments, and the report confirms that everyday experiences can support science learning for virtually all people. Informal learning environments are voluntary learning settings. The learner can walk away from the exhibit, change the television channel, or click to a new website. Thus, in addition to measuring what is being learned about science in such settings and what science is being learned, it's important to determine what will engage the learners and hold their attention, and that's a crucial topic for researchers. There are major challenges in this research domain. What outcomes should be expected in informal learning environments and what assessments are best for measuring them? Museum goers don't expect to take a formal test after a casual visit. The experiences are often brief and fragmented, so it may not be reasonable to expect depth of content learning from a single exposure. Researchers are studying such outcomes as attitude, awareness, interest, and behavior. 
Their methods include self-report, recording visitors' conversations, interviews, and the timing and tracking studies of behaviors. There's a continued need for valid and reliable instruments and measures to assess the appropriate outcomes of learning in informal settings. NSF-funded researchers are addressing these challenges through the ISE program and others. I find that there's enthusiasm across NSF about sharing exciting science with diverse audiences through informal learning opportunities. We recognize the great potential of these venues for engaging youth who may not thrive in the formal education system. Some ISE projects focus specifically on learners from groups traditionally underrepresented in STEM, and most project include, projects include outreach to these groups. The focus on broadening participation extends well beyond EHR. In the Directorate for Geosciences, for example, there's a project that prepares teachers in urban settings to integrate the resources of their city into their STEM teaching. In the Directorate for Computer and Information Science and Engineering, a project with the Boys and Girls Clubs of America uses culturally responsive approaches to attract and retain high school students in computer science. The NSF has been able to build a diverse and dynamic portfolio of research, development, and model building to promote the learning of all people at all ages through informal science education environments. The portfolio is increasingly robust in the area of research about learning in informal settings. Through programs in the Division of Research on Learning, we plan to continue encouraging and supporting scientific discovery in informal science education. I'd like to thank the subcommittee for this opportunity to share with you information about investments made by the NSF in this area. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my remarks. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Now, Dr. Bell. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I'm, I'm Philip Bell from the University of Washington. I served as co-chair of the Committee on Learning Science and Informal Environments of the National Research Council, and I ask that my written remarks be made part of the record of the hearing. I was asked to describe the work of my research group and to summarize the conclusions and recommendations of the recent NRC consensus study. I participate in a large-scale interdisciplinary research effort called the Learning and Informal and Formal Environments Center, or Life Center, a collaboration of the University of Washington, Stanford University, SRI International. Uh, it's, a, it's funded through NSF's Science of Learning Center program within the SBE directorate. Uh, in life, we study the social foundations of how people learn across a broad range of learning environments from classrooms, science centers, aquaria, and zoos, to after-school programs, internet sites, video game environments, and in the midst of family life. My research group investigates how youth and families from multicultural urban communities develop science and technology-related expertise across different settings. In our research, we have found a surprising and troubling pattern where children pursue and engage in sophisticated STEM learning outside of school, but those interests and early competencies are not recognized or built upon in the classroom. Just one example, we followed an elementary school-aged boy for several years documenting his learning across settings who developed significant expertise related to mechanical engineering, from building robotic kits at home to engaging in complex puzzle uh, you know, activity on the science center floor. But in the classroom, he's not perceived as being interested in academic subjects at all. Such disconnects in learning between home and school are putting these particular children at higher risk of academic failure in STEM. Our, researcher, our research further indica indicates that STEM academic achievement, although crucial, is only part of what's needed to cultivate expertise in STEM and that people's activities in informal environments are an equally crucial platform for learning, as we are hearing uh, from Congressman Ehlers. Efforts to enhance the scientific capacity of society typically focus on formal schooling. Life Center researchers developed the diagram shown over on the easel there to my left, to your right, um, to characterize roughly the amount of time individuals spend in informal and formal environments, with lifelong learning along the horizontal and life-wide learning as people go across settings along the vertical. What's often overlooked or under underestimated is the potential of STEM learning in non-school settings. Each year, tens of millions of Americans, young and old, explore and learn about science and by visiting informal learning institutions, participating in programs, and countless more use media to pursue their science-related interests. From a lifelong, life-wide perspective, it's imperative that we leverage informal learning environments to support workforce development, civic participation in STEM-related uh, policy issues, uh, and to promote scientific literacy among the citizenry. 
The informal science education program, as we already heard, uh, funded a consensus study with the board on science education at the NRC with the goal of synthesizing the existing research about how people learn in informal environments. The interdisciplinary committee that was convened organized its analysis by looking at the various places where science learning occurs. These included everyday experiences like hiking in a national park with your family, pursuing a hobby, or learning on the farm, as well as design settings, such as visiting a science center, zoo, aquarium, or botanical garden, or participating in educational programming, such as summer science programs for youth, environmental monitoring experiences for citizens, or elder hostel programs that are related to science. The committee found abundant evidence that informal learning environments routinely support significant science learning for individuals from all ages, from a broad variety of backgrounds in ways that uniquely serve their personal and professional interests and that relate to the broader STEM-related interests of society. However, the field is lacking a clear statement of goals that are appropriate for these settings, learning goals, which can be measured. The committee developed and used a strands of science learning framework that articulates science-specific capabilities supported by informal learning environments. The six interrelated strands reflect the field's commitment to getting learners to participate and connect to science in stimulating, interactive, contemporary, and personally relevant ways. In closing, I want to mention some high po priority policy issues that are described in the report. First. In terms of broadening participation in STEM, studies do suggest that informal learning environments may be particularly effective for youth from historically non-dominant communities. However, there's variability in the success of these environments in attracting and engaging diverse audiences. We believe that a better understanding of the naturally occurring science learning uh, in a diverse range of communities is needed to inform basic theory about how people learn, as well as to design informal learning experiences that actually are tailored to these communities. Secondly, we believe that there should be sustained support for high quality informal programs and experiences that focus on STEM. Informal learning environments represent a crucial part of society's infrastructure for STEM education. Um, thirdly, although it's important to understand the impact of informal environments, a more important question may be how science learning occurs across a range of formal and informal environments. The science learning literatures and fields are segmented in ways that are at odds with how people routinely traverse settings and can engage in learning across those settings day to day. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to be here and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Bell and Ms. Ingram. Thank you, Chairman and members of the subcommittee, and thank you for inviting us here today to speak with you. I'd also like to thank uh, NSF and Dr. Bell and his co-authors for investing their time and thoughtfulness in producing this report uh, that is so important and informs um, our efforts. As you know, which is why we're here, science and technology are critically important to human well-being, economic growth, and a sustainable environment. America's social and economic future depends on new generations of scientists who can help sustain our legacy of innovation and science leadership. Our schools cannot do this alone. Wonderful, inspirational, and important resources exist outside of a classroom in our national laboratories, in our universities, in our museums, in our zoos, in our libraries, in our universities. If we share the objective of supporting science achievement to create our next generation of innovators, then we must ensure that these resources are well aligned to support the engagement and excellence of our youth in science. When we adopt this shared objective, the lines distinguishing between formal and informal education become blurred and lose relevance. What we have are a variety of learning strategies and a variety of tools, all targeted to ensure broad access, opportunity, and success in the sciences. At the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, we have embraced this shared objective and have designed our historic transformation to reflect this new direction. We are unified in our commitment as an institution to become an esteemed educational institution that will play a critical role in the advancement of science education. And with that recognition, we have adopted the vision to inspire and motivate children to achieve their full potential in the fields of science, technology, medicine, and engineering. And in doing so, we have recognized that in order to overcome this quiet crisis in our scientists and engineers in the U.S., we must diversify and broaden those who are engaged and inspired into careers in the sciences. So in adopting that vision and taking this new direction, that means 
that we have changed our practices in the design of our exhibitions in how we extend the reach of those exhibitions through programming and in our view of our collaborative leadership role. In our exhibitions, we have intentionally adopted an integrated approach in which our education teams participate in our exhibit design process to ensure that the content embedded in the exhibitions is aligned with national, international, and local learning standards and objectives so that they can be broadly used as tools to enhance science achievement in the classroom. We have reflected on and embedded the Atlas of Science Literacy created by the American um, Association for the Advancement of Science, Project 2061. And in doing so, our tools will become world-class instruments to advance science education. Through our Center for the Advancement of Science Education, which we have newly formed as part of this transformation, we extend the content of our exhibi exhibitions to where our guests and youth are. That means that within our museum, we have now poised our staff to engage in fun, inspirational ways with our guests around content to give them an opportunity for contextual learning, to have fun, to provide the inspiration for which we are known, but to provide them with minds-on, hands-on experiences. These opportunities are now available um, for our 1.5 million uh, visitors a year almost and to the nearly 300,000 students that visit us on field trips. Our vision can tell us to do more though. With a series of community initiatives, we work with 57 community organizations throughout Chicago. We have developed the Institute for Quality Science Teaching in which we support the capacity and competency of our science teachers in our local school districts. And we have accepted a collaborative leadership role um, because none of this happens without partners. So in our Institute for Quality Teaching, that means we work with our universities to ensure the ability of our teachers to receive um, credit hours and endorsements through Science Chicago is a collaborative effort with 140 partners throughout the Chicago area. We have built awareness of the scientific resources in the region and built connections to them. With this work, um, we have the capacity to help share with others how to really propel science education um, through informal settings. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Ready for uh, Mr. Lippincott. Good morning, Chairman, <coughs> Chairman Lipinski, Ranking Member Ehlers, and members of the uh, esteemed members of the subcommittee. My name is Rob Lippincott, and I'm Senior Vice President for Education at PBS. As a former teacher, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to address the most effective role of informal environments in STEM education. Public broadcasting was founded to lead in informal education on the air, online, on the ground, guided by research, and actively supporting educators. On the air, public broadcasting has been a leader in educational television for more than 50 years. Available free of charge to 99% of Americans' television households, PBS reaches more than 65 million people, 14 million of them kids each week, inviting them to experience the worlds of science, history, and public affairs. <clears throat> Informal science education begins with our award-winning science television program, some of which you may recognize. Nova, Nature, Design Squad, Curious George, and most recently, Sid the Science Kid. We even have Neil deGrasse Tyson, named the sexiest astrophysicist alive hosting our, by People magazine, hosting our Nova Science Now magazine. However, TV is only a small part of the informal education story. Broadband access is dramatically changing the opportunities for nation's educators to have, that they have to improve STEM education. I want to share two examples of how PBS is trying to use the web to support informal education. PBS Kids Go, what we call a broadband channel, and a project we call EDCAR, the Educational Digital Content Asset Repository. PBS Kids Go is an online media portal which includes full-length TV episodes, clips, and games. And I believe that this is a first glimpse of what television may look like for all ages very soon. How kids use PBS Kids Go to find videos and games. Let's go to the Science Channel and see what things we can find. As you can see, this channel features science-themed clips from Go shows, such as Fetch with Ruff Ruffman, Design Squad, and Dragonfly TV. In this show, nanotechnology is a big focus. Let's click on the Nanocar Engineer clip. 
Kids can vote if they like the clip, send the clip to a friend, learn more about the video, play the full episode, and play a related game about the video. In this case, the related game is also about nanobots. As you can see, kids are not just watching TV, but playing with the characters, learning through games, and exploring ideas. This set of tools is a powerful first step in building STEM-savvy citizens. We need to give students at every age and their teachers in increased resources to this kind of multimodal learning. EDCAR is a database of video and digital resources created by public media producers and our partners in museum, university, and research communities. By collecting and organizing the resources and then aligning them to learning standards, we create the best STEM learning tools for use in home, at school, and in every learning setting. The first offering that we're creating is based on STEM, uh, is based on STEM for the middle school. Uh, a teacher might use this uh, kind of a lesson structured with an introduction and objectives to, to select a learning uh, chunk of video, a small clip that's been cut uh, to introduce, in this case, a lesson on the hydrosphere, uh, a video about where is the water. Or the teacher might select a very different kind of a, a video asset or a digital asset, this one based on two different images, one of the Muir Glacier in August of 1941, the other in August of 2004, which in fact might lead students to want to look at the map of Arctic ice. But, uh, to truly make a difference in informal education efforts, we've developed a 360-degree approach to children, literally trying to surround them at home, school, and at play with learning opportunities and media. We are working to duplicate this success <coughs> across STEM disciplines. Recent findings from rigorous studies on Super Y and Between the Lions show clear and measurable gains in every area targeted. This shows that PBS is able to use media to move the needle and improve abilities of kids to learn. Again, we will be working to duplicate the success that we've had with literacy across STEM disciplines. But of course, if we really want to change learning, both informal and formal, in a lasting way, we need to prepare our teachers and caregivers so they are equipped and excited about sharing science. Through PBS TeacherLine, an online teacher professional development program, we're building a how-to course uh, for caregivers and early preschool and after school teachers. Welcome to my room. As I'm an online graphic in an online world, my room has the best and brightest resources the illustrators could give me. I know that in the real world, you might not have as much space or resources given to you, and you may have many more children to work with. My room is designed to give you some ideas for how you can use stories and digital media with children. Help children talk about shapes, numbers, and measurements to develop early math skills. A class pet is great for science investigations and journal writing. <clears throat> This, the reception to this course has been exceptional. Uh, for example, North Dakota has appro approved this course for its child care providers. And this is working also in Arizona, Illinois, Louisiana, Minnesota, Tennessee, and Texas. This kind of anywhere, anywhere, anytime pajama compatible professional development is critical. And a consistent theme across all of what we're doing is partnership. And I'd be happy to explain more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lippincott, and uh, I assure you that it's not just children who enjoy the uh, multimodal uh, <laughs> learning there. Dr. Hall. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, on behalf of the Chicago Zoological Society, I, I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. The mission of the society is to inspire conservation leadership by connecting people with wildlife and nature. The uh, Chicago Zoological Society operates Brookfield Zoo, one of the top zoological institutions in North America. In addition to being recognized as one of the global leaders in conservation of biodiversity, we are a major cultural attraction with 2.1 million visitors a year and over 90,000 member households. Um, just as a witness in this hearing, we, uh, our institution is deeply concerned about the failure of our nation's uh, science education system to stem the declining performance of American students. Just in our case, for example, 20% uh, of the high school uh, students in Illinois are below grade level in science. There are multiple root causes for this underachievement in science. I will uh, focus on, on four uh, major fronts that we're tackling. One of them is uh, providing science exploration for families and children as they, as they come and visit our facility. The second one is a possibility of very strong science education for teaching by partnering <coughs> with large school districts, in our case with the Chicago public school system. 
The uh, third one is developing science careers for minorities and underserved communities. And the fourth is the exploration of possibilities to measure and provide metrics for informal learning. Um, uh, I will briefly uh, mention uh, that zoos provide unique opportunities for everybody to explore the natural world outside the home and outside the uh, classroom. And over two million people uh, visit our zoos a year, and we're providing a special um, inquiry, uh, comparative level uh, for environmental issues such as climate change and species extinctions. I also want to mention our education partnerships to build uh, teacher scientists. One of the main problems is the national shortage of fully, fully qualified science teachers. In our area, less than 4% of uh, science teachers actually hold endorsements in science, and I don't think our, di our, our area is any different than uh, nationwide. But surveys have showed that teachers that have little scientific expertise actually transmit in, in uh, direct or in indirect means that lack of confidence to the students, making science seem difficult or unexciting. That problem stems at the very early stages of the classroom life. We train teachers, and in this case, we uh, uh, tackled a very creative partnership with the Chicago Public School System, which is one of the largest and most complex school sy systems in the country. We have developed extensive teacher training program that starts with developing the basics of scientific inquiry from one credit hour courses to summer institutes all the way to science graduate school with several colleges in the, in the Midwest region. This is a major institutional initiative that has included thousands of teachers in Illinois and nearby states in the Great Lakes region over the three, uh, last three years. And it's a source of personal institutional pride that these teachers are actually uh, inspiring underserved segments in particular, school-aged Hispanic girls and African-American boys, uh, at, when they are finding that science can be a life call and a career destination. I also want to mention how we're developing a career ladder for engagement of minorities and underserved communities. Our society, as many other uh, in the industry, it requires a highly trained te technical workforce. We have zoologists, engineers, researchers, statisticians, and geneticists with a very strong background. We, as an institution, have uh, identified diversity as one of the uh, institutional strategic goals, and we decided that we cannot take a passive approach in this. We are developing a science-based uh, lifelong learning, starting with thousands of families of predominantly African-American and Hispanic neighborhoods with a very dedicated outreach program and developing opportunities for these inner city families to develop nature and, and science. A, f a camping trip in the Indiana dunes by inner city families is a lifelong, uh, lifetime experience that opens new frontiers in developing and understanding the natural world and inspiring new careers in science. Once these children move to high school, we are developing our youth science conservation leadership program that develops uh, professional preparation schools that includes in dress code, engaging the public, speaking sk skills, team building, in addition to carrying independent science projects. So they actually carry these projects at a very early age in high school. We are developing also metrics for uh, measuring informal science education. Uh, as a major provider of informal science education, we have helped to create the emerging field of conservation psychology the scientific study between the reciprocal studies of hu uh, the re reciprocal relationship between humans and nature. Our research questions are addressing how humans care about nature and how do they engage and psychological factors that affect the engagement of humans in science. Perhaps also one of the uh, most per pervasive obstacles in the lack of common standards and benchmarks for measuring informal science learning and education. Just as all other panel members, we really are really needing uh, these psychological metrics for developing personal comfort and confidence in applying this education. Uh, we ca call actively for this partnership to develop these be benchmarking indicators. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you again for the opportunity to appear the, before this committee, and I will be happy to answer some questions. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of you for, for your testimony, and I'm going to open up for the first round of questions. And it's the uh, Chair's prerogative to go first, but I am going to uh, recognize uh, Mr. Griffith 
for, uh, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and we appreciate each and every one of you coming. Uh, I'd like to make just a comment. Uh, I'm a retired oncologist, but a tadpole changed my life, and the uh, transformation uh, watching the tadpole become a frog and have my little brother ask me how did it know to do that uh, <laughs> stimulated me into a career of, of uh, being interested in science. One of the things that I think that we uh, sometimes uh, maybe overlook, probably not overlook, but in, in all fairness to what we're trying to accomplish here, my great question for America is, is that why aren't our children learning to read? Why aren't they reading at grade level by the third grade? Because they learn to read, and then after the third grade, they read to learn. And you're, you may be seeing children that your teachers can teach, but you're not seeing a great many who we have lost along the wayside. So I commend you. I think that. Uh, the great question in America, because we only represent 6% of the world's population, yet we're number one in space travel, we're number one in military, we're number one in the development of drugs and, and, and entrepreneurship, means that you have your work cut out for you because uh, the statistics that we don't think that we're the leaders anymore in some of those areas are wrong, but we are getting that feeling at times. But uh, I applaud you and thank you for being here and our chairman for bringing this subject up. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, and we uh, you know, look forward to your, your contributions to the, to the subcommittee. I'll now recognize Dr. Ehlers for, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate your testimony. It was very interesting and it, it I grew up in a farming community, and uh, it was amazing how much of the science that students learned was learned on the farm. Obviously, they learned about pullers, pulleys and levers in the farm work, trying to get the hay in the mow, et cetera. They learned a lot about the life sciences and the reproductive cycle uh, in genetics in their work on the farm by watching the animals. And that's, that's missing today. Uh, I'm just wondering what, uh, first of all, Dr. Bell, did, when, in the work that you did in the report, did you go back and look at prior years and see what the difference was today between informal education and what it was 30 years ago, 70 years ago, et cetera? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, we did do, we went back in the literatures um, as far as we could. One of the challenges with doing the consensus study is informal science education is such a broad variety of different endeavors as we've been hearing across the panel. And you can think of community programming for youth and kind of layer on even more than what we've been able to talk about thus far. Um, we, we had discussion about generational shifts um, from uh, kind of over the last 50 years. Uh, and the, um, the age base, so one, one feature that's really unique of informal learning environments is that you get mixed generational groups together engaged in discussions of science. And so in that sense, people that did grow up on the farm but now reside in the city can engage in conversations with their children and grandchildren and, and perhaps they're a docent at a museum and they can engage with the public more broadly around uh, related aspects of the expertise that they've been developing. Uh, that said, we also um, were orienting to a number of efforts that are organized across the country that where farming and subsistence agriculture is still uh, you know, a focus of community, community life and activity. And so we were looking at evaluation you know, reports of 4-H you know, programs and, and those sorts of uh, endeavors. And so to some degree, we did try to capture that in the report. What I would say is that um, we wanted to articulate, uh, you know, as we looked across the literature, this shared image of science learning across six strands that we identify. Uh, and two of them are, are particularly uh, important to informal learning environments around 
the prior interests that get cultivated. And I think we've already started to hear a number of those stories, the tadpole stories, exactly of that kind. Uh, and then over time, how that learning gets sustained um, by a range of others in your life and access to experiences that sustain it and keep it deepening. Uh, and then you come to identify with science uh, and see that you can learn from it and contribute to it. Uh, and that is, those two particular dimensions um, are very strong within the work within the informal world. Uh, so that's a bit of a response. Uh, thank you, Dr. Farini Mundi. Um, how how does, can you just give us some insight into how informal science education supported research at at the NSF differs from other education and human services research or human resources research? Certainly, thank thank you. Yes, certainly. Thank you very much for the question. Um, in many ways, the research questions that have to do with informal science learning uh, overlap substantially with research questions that have to do with learning in a general sense. Um, your last question actually caused me to think about a whole line of research in my own field in mathematics education that looks at um, everyday uses of mathematics, everyday mathematics in, um, in sometimes in other countries, children who are, are street vendors or candy sellers. There have been really interesting studies that have looked at how um, how mathematics gets used in a day-to-day -day way and similar studies in science. And so that's an example of, of a line of research that bears upon informal science education, uh, but that doesn't necessarily come up through the informal science education program. So we have several programs within EHR and elsewhere in the foundation that fund um, basic research about learning, that fund uh, programs to look at motivation and engagement, which are some of the fundamental questions here, and then the relationships of motivation and engagement to learning, um, to, to long-term impact, uh, and so forth. So, so it's fair to say that both the informal science ed program itself, which includes um, opportunities for research on learning, but also the, the formal learning kinds of programs like um, research and um, evaluation on education in science and engineering. The Reese program uh, also is a place where there are a number of studies that bear upon these general cognitive and affective issues that are of great interest for moving forward in informal science ed, along with the development of instruments, which is, as we've heard from everyone, a crucial place. Uh, and that, that occurs across programs. Yeah, well, I, I admire the work you're doing, and I deeply appreciate it. Um, that's true for all of you. Uh, but it seems to me it's very hard to get a handle on these things. Yeah. Part of part of the problem is the rapid changes in society. You know what what you're doing, Mr. Lippincott, is is a good example of taking a new technology and and using it very well. At the same time, kids m miss out on some other things. I recall in my childhood, I really enjoyed working on the cars, and they were simple enough that you could work on the car and fix it yourself. I did a valve job on my car by myself. Uh, today, you don't even dare to touch anything on a car. It'll take $1,500 to repair the damage you did. <laughs> uh, and uh, similarly, the computers are marvelous things, wonderful things for kids to use, but they can't take them apart and see how they work. And so uh, I think we face some real challenges in, in trying to address those issues. I see my time has expired. Uh, you'll it's a... Yeah, interesting ideas there, and I know that uh, especially my background is a mechanical engineer, so the uh, I have a much better understanding in I guess a, a better more of a love of mechanics. So I do uh, understand Mr. Ayler's uh, concerns there about what we can't do now. Uh, I'm going to uh, now recognize uh, Mr. Carnahan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Ranking Member. Um, I come from St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, we are blessed with a wealth of science and engineering institutions there, and uh, which we are always looking for great opportunities to plug kids into and, and get them uh, excited at an early age because the, the practical benefit to those kids, but also they're the next generation of people that are going to be those uh, scientists and engineers to fill in uh, with those the great public and private institutions that we have around the St. Louis region. Uh, but my question is uh, to the panel, um, and what are the key factors in, in really forging a successful partnership uh, between informal organizations and formal uh, educational institutions? Um, and is it hard to quantify 
those measurements? Are there uh, metrics out there that exist? Are there barriers to measure that um, uh, in terms of how we assess uh, what works well? And really to any and all on the panel. If I may answer. Thank you for the question. Um, let me address at least part of that, which is that, and I think this relates back to the prior discussion, which is how do we overcome kind of the distance that technology might have imposed between, you know, the, the, the inspiration and the inquiry that was generated in prior generations to propel the, the interest in science. And that is the opportunity that we have from that technology, however, is to better coordinate and align the external resources that do exist. And coordinated efforts uh, like we've undertaken in Chicago through Science Chicago and hopefully um, some additional work to really partner, identify the resources that exist, identify how those resources align with the learning standards and the curriculum that our schools are, are trying to instill in our youth and to make those resources transparent and accessible to the families, communities, and teachers who can access them for the benefit of our youth. So to the extent that there's a lot of great programs out there, we have this additional significant barrier of making sure that people know what those programs are and how to access those programs. That takes significant coordination and partnership in and of itself. How you measure that, if you, if you coordinate that through a website, there are ways of doing that. You can build in management tools to make sure that it's being used, that the conversations are happening, that the connections are being made. But you have to partner. You have to work closely with your local school districts. You have to make sure you understand what they're trying to accomplish in the classroom and that the resources are reflective. But one thing that you can't do is assume that external resources are just going to immediately adopt the strategic vision of your local school district. It has to be a shared objective and shared strategic visions, and we have to build our programs to support that outcome of science achievement, or we won't be able to have that impact. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, within the, the bounds of the report, we were uh, looking at uh, a range of different kinds of articulations between schools and science-rich institutions in the informal uh, sector. Um, the, the, the first point to be made, there was a time and place where the, the, the idea that informal learning was something different than formal learning, and that might have been a conversation. The committee didn't end up there. The, the committee ended up actually saying there's a shared set of goals related to science learning that we can think about what the unique uh, contributions are to be made in schools versus other places where, you know, uh, within the informal education uh, sectors. So that's kind of more the, the centerpiece. We looked at field trip studies um, because their school groups do make extensive use of museums and botanical gardens and zoos and aquaria. Uh, and, you know, the, the research points to really uh, important articulation between the, you know, the role of those. Uh, you know, experiences outside of school in relation to what's being learned in school, both before the visit and after the visit. Uh, at the same time, uh, kind of the active involvement of the teacher in planning those efforts, so the teacher isn't uh, backing away from the activity once it, you know, shows, once they show up uh, at the museum. What, what was interesting is, is that there's, um, you know, it's a widespread thing that uh, museums and, uh, and informal institutions also engage in teacher training, but there isn't an empirical peer-reviewed research literature on how that plays out, actually. So we couldn't speak to the details of the quality of those experiences, and it's, a, it's an, kind of a, an established gap in the literature. Thank you. I, I want to uh, just address it, if I might. Uh, the, I think in terms of public television, for instance, I've talked a little bit about how we kind of are uh, perfectly aligned with my, what might be called strand one of Dr. Bell's research around gathering interest and motivating interest in, in science. When we've tried to work uh, much more deeply with teachers and schools, because of course the real gold standard is, is that kids are truly interested and that they actually, we can, we can show their achievement. Uh, so that, for instance, our teacher line courses have required us to partner because we have to be really relentlessly humble about really what impact our television or media might have in the actual classroom. So we partnered. We have 23 institutions that, that, that grant credit because, of course, that's their role and, their, and it's aligning with their interest that allows us to be effective. And also with hundreds of local organizations in every 
uh, city in St. Louis, in Chicago, and across the country, where the point of service, meaning really the 4-H clubs and the boys and girls clubs as well as in the schools. The degree to which we can conform our goals for the program to the goals of, of learning uh, achievement that, that have been set by local standards, that's the degree which we're successful. Trying to get that entire sort of life cycle of an idea uh, understood and measured is the really tricky part. What we've been trying to do is try to uh, talk about uh, how each piece of what we're creating has a set of research around it, and we can prove that it is well-crafted, it's based on scientific research, and that it will work. We also want to work and prove that the way that we're using teacher professional development, the, the process that we're using, and will result in, in increased confidence and competence of using teachers, teachers using media. And of course, the ultimate uh, test, I think, of a, of a partnership is that it continues. Just Thank if, you. If I may add, um, we we've, we've uh, we receive almost 250,000 school children in our in our uh, zoo. I mean, it's at the season. It's a flood of yellow buses in our in our facility. We have decided that we need to really focus on on teacher training. It is an issue that we we can get as many children in our facility, but truly, uh, teachers are uh, one of the key roles. And as second in Dr. Bell's uh, uh, testimony is, is the issue of competency and confidence in teachers that it really percolates through the classroom. A teacher that is unsure about his or her credentials in science or even exploring science, it doesn't matter if, if uh, she is accredited to it, it, it transmits that uh, insecurity in, in to the classroom. So one of the issues that we're measuring with our six partner degree granting institutions, six colleges and universities that we're working, is actually developing indicators for that confidence and competency in teachers. We believe that that is one of the STEM roles of, of, our, of our facility. And developing that very basic inquiry, comparative inquiry skills in teachers. There's a grave emphasis now on, on uh, technology and, and issues. Uh, about advanced science, but we have lost what uh, Mr. Ellers uh, uh, presented is that uh, inquiry that happens in the farm, that comparative issues that you happen when you're in, in the field, and we believe that that is somewhat uh, lost. Uh, we really want to instill those very early stages of the comparative inquiry in teachers, and that is the root of many of the training uh, that may happen for teachers. Thank you. Thank you to the panel, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. It uh, you know, certainly is a, a critical part of this, is the um, uh, putting together the uh, informal and in, in the formal education. Uh, I'm now going to recognize myself for, for five minutes, and I uh, have plenty of questions here. But I want to start out, uh, we're, talking, we're just talking about a lot of this was uh, relationships, partnerships with the uh, schools. I want to ask about partnerships with institutes of higher education, uh, partnerships with industry, partnerships with uh, national labs. I have a uh, last Congress, I had introduced a bill and working again on doing that in this Congress to uh, authorize uh, funding for partnerships between science museums and uh, energy labs uh, so that uh, we can better utilize the resources, the knowledge, uh, what we're doing at uh, putting into energy labs to help teach STEM ed, which also will help educate people, not just, not just educate about, you know, in STEM ed, but also educate them about what's going on and the investments we're making in our DOE labs. But I just wanted to uh, throw that question out there. What other partnerships uh, do you have that uh, or you know of uh, between these informal education institutions and some of these other institutions? Doctor? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. Um, in, in many of our funded projects, there are partnerships with institutions of higher education, uh, particularly around these research issues because the involvement of cognitive scientists, um, STEM disciplinary education researchers, uh, sometimes sociologists, anthropologists, and so forth, those become a part of this, as well as, of course, the scientific expertise that's crucial in these um, kinds of co-funded efforts. So we have a number of examples, and I can get back to you with some specific um, 
examples. We also um, have examples of some collaborations that are coming through the national labs and, and uh, other kinds of settings. Um, I was just looking at a project uh, today about um, helping to improve students' understanding of um, the scientific experiments at Fermilab. Uh, and so we have examples in many cases where these partnerships are crucial because this field is so broad in its span that it requires lots of kinds of experts to, to move it forward uh, well. Dr. Bell? I can give um, one kind of personal example, so I'm kind of taking off the, the, the committee hat in terms of the, the consensus report, but we have funding from the National Science Foundation through uh, the COSI program, the, the Centers for Ocean Science Education Excellence, that has brought together in, at the University of Washington in the Seattle area, uh, scientists in ocean sciences together with uh, folks like myself that are learning scientists, uh, together with informal education experts at the aquarium to engage um, the broader citizenry in citizen science uh, activities related to issues that uh, are kind of local uh, but scientifically rich questions about land water interaction and kind of our individual behaviors that we make choices in, in, in daily life and how that impacts the environment. And it, through a sustained multi-year effort, um, these different groups have been able to productively collaborate in how do you engage a broad network of citizens in doing, in helping us better understand this issue by collecting data and samples from across a broader variety of places that then come to the University of Washington to get analyzed more, more directly. And so that's, it, there's a ripple effect there as well uh, where um, I've learned a lot more about science through that endeavor. Uh, our collaborators in ocean sciences have changed the way that they do their teaching uh, on the campus in relation to knowing more about how people learn as well. And I think that's kind of a concrete instance of what can be done in those sorts of partnerships. Yes. The thing group. <laughs> in addition to the uh, generalized type of partnership and coordination that I mentioned earlier as being imperative, let me uh, share with you a couple of specific examples where the museum and the youth that we serve have benefited from coordinating with higher learning international laboratories. Um, one is in our Institute for, the Advan for um, uh, Quality Science Teaching. Um, it is important to our school district that their science teachers become credentialed. And it is important to us and to our youth and the teachers that be they become credentialed in a quality manner so that their performance actually has an impact on the student achievement. So in helping um, the Chicago public schools reach their goal of having every middle school teacher having a subject matter credential uh, in science in the middle grades within the next two years, um, we have had the advantage of having partnered for the last two years um, with a couple of different university to try, universities to try out what programs might work to support um, to support teacher professional development. So we've worked with National Lewis University, Loyola University Chicago, as well as um, the Illinois Institute of Technology. IIT, by way of example, we have, are building a joint credentialing program. Our programs target teachers who are not comfortable teaching science, but find themselves in science classrooms. You cannot learn or inspire youth if you yourself have no confidence in the subject matter. So we focus on building that confidence and the competency and the content, as well as the teaching strategies. So we have um, a pool of teachers, 128 annually, who are with us in a program that can earn them three credit hours. And these are teachers that would not sign up with IIT for a science credentialing program because, frankly, they never had it in their professional future to be science teachers. But because we've built the access, we have partnered with IIT to offer low-cost credit hours, they find themselves moving from not touching it with a 10-foot pole to having three hours towards an 18-hour credential by the end of the year. And then they get to sign up for another workshop with us the next year, and all of a sudden they have six. So what we're trying to do is to build access to that pool of teachers that don't even dream of themselves as being science, but find themselves teaching it anyway, and to build that pool towards being competent subject matter science teachers. The other um, quick example um, in partnership is with Argonne National Laboratories. Um, in our fab lab, um, which is a really great hands-on where the kids can come in and design and fabricate um, all sorts of different things uh, from furniture to electronics uh, to keychains. 
And in doing that, we don't necessarily have the technical competency around the software and the evolution um, that our MIT partners um, would require, but Argonne does, and they have been a partner from the beginning with us. So we get to have youth from our youth development program, the Science Achievers, participate uh, every Saturday morning with the support of volunteers from Argonne National Laboratories who now have taken ownership of that vision, the work that can be done to extend access to that uh, technological and engineering learning in the museum. So there are a lot of opportunities, but it takes working together to find where your common interests are so that we can access the scientific competencies of the Argonne scientists, but then help bridge it to the youth that want to be inspired by it. Well, I certainly want to, I'd like to come there and use the uh, fab lab. Sounds, sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> You're more than welcome, and it really is. <laughs> Mr. Lippincott? Uh, just as a quick example, I showed you a little bit, uh, just a smidgen of the STEM science uh, resource, the resources that we're trying to gather as part of EDCAR. Um, we started by, uh, on that project by trying to figure out where we could contribute the most. And we asked that question of a broad variety, students and teachers and school systems and universities. And most people said STEM. And in fact, most people said STEM. Within the STEM, they wanted earth science, which is a, such a pivotal part of the, of the sequence of learning science in school, and a, and a bumpy road for some, a bump in the road for a lot of kids. But, and then within earth science, climate science. And we asked why. And it's because kids are so excited. They're so interested in, in climate science. They all know about weather, and they all hear about things on the news, and they're all interested, but also puzzled. The more we looked at this, the more we needed partners. And so we went uh, certainly to the NSF, who have been a great partner for us in many ways. The National Science, the STEM Digital Library is an outstanding collection of, of materials that now we think we can help present. But we needed the curriculum, so we went to NOAA, which has produced a, a very carefully mapped uh, strands of the science curriculum for climate science. And of course, we went to school systems where in fact, school systems in every state have standards and have exact standards about which part of the science curriculum they need to learn. We've been actually working with the CCSSO, the Council of Chief State School Officers, who are after what they call fewer, higher, clearer, maybe perhaps national standards at some point <clears throat> about this. But clearly, in order to get to kids where, in the area that they said they're most interested, we have to help teachers because they told us, even if they have advanced degrees in science, let alone are challenged by not thinking of themselves as scientists, they don't know how to teach this, this science. They don't really know what this science, and, and they don't have the resources. They look in their textbooks and there's not very much in that chapter. And so <clears throat> we felt like that was a place to start. So by working through partners like this, we can go to where the science is best, we can really help science uh, teachers where they really need it the most, and where we think actually media has a really appropriate role to play, not substituting for field experience, but really amplifying what teachers need. Thank you. I just uh, uh, one simple example is that we, we are now launching our second graduate degree, master's degree for science for teachers, actually. Many, many of the graduate programs for teachers have been in education. We're trying to develop these science degrees for teachers, and there's quite a market for that. Teachers are truly interested in this. Our first experiment was a consortium between Fermilab, um, the Ar uh, Morton Arboretum, uh, Brookfield Zoo, and Benedictine University. And now we're launching a national program with Miami University in Ohio that is bringing several uh, five zoos in, um, in the country. And it's an advanced inquiry program that develops uh, basic in scientific inquiry skills for teachers that are really want to uh, jump into that into that level of, of scientific training, and it's about teaching science, but also pedagogical tools for teaching science. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, extensive answers. I think it's a very important. The, the partnerships uh, are really critical in forming those, and all of you had a a lot of, over a lot of different areas, a lot of different partners, and I think that's something we need to work on uh, also on the federal level, see what we can do to, to encourage more of that. Uh, we're joined by uh, a, uh, another new member on the, uh, on the subcommittee. Uh, I will recognize Ms. Fudge for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank all of you for being here today, and I do have just a, a couple of questions after I make a brief comment. Um, I want to first share with you that on Friday of last week, I had the opportunity to attend the grand opening of our first STEM school in the city of Cleveland. 
Uh, it's called MC Squared STEM. Uh, the thing that's exciting about it is that it is actually housed in General Electric's Lighting Division, Neela Park Campus. Um, the school, obviously, the setting of the school creates some, um, some of just what we're talking about today. I mean, because the young people will have an opportunity to, on a weekly basis, have lunch with engineers, with scientists. They will have hands-on experience. So we're talking about the same kinds of things that you're talking about today. But I guess my question really becomes that uh, in the city of Cleveland, where if you're not familiar with our area, uh, it has been deemed the, num the number one or two poor city in America for the last three years. Uh, what happens to the young people who don't have the resources to attend the zoo or to go to the science center or to go to museums if their schools do not take them? And most of the schools don't have the resources as well either. So I'm really looking at how we address the issue of underserved youth. Uh, MC Squared STEM is wonderful but it's a very small group of children. How do we get to the rest of them? That's my first question, and that's for anyone on the panel. If I may briefly answer that question. Um, I think it, part of what at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago we've done is reflect on how to leverage what we do and the inspiration um, that we've built in our exp exhibitions as well as our um, expertise in inquiry-based um, science teaching and thought about how to extend that into our communities and to build partnerships with our communities. So we've designed a set of uh, community initiatives that is intended to build an ecosystem where the, the ultimate outcome, in my mind, is that, um, that youth and community organizations are mm -hmm. getting their first taste of science from the coolest, hippest communicators of science, their brother's best friend, who is in one of our other programs. So we start that with a science club approach where we're not, we don't have to replicate after school programs. There are hundreds of community organizations throughout our urban areas that are with kids every day after school. What they need is help in developing sound subject matter curriculum that's fun and engaging and that the kids can relate to in their organizations after school. So we develop the curriculum, we provide the materials, we train them on the delivery of it, but we do more than that. We view this as an entry to a relationship, not with the community, just with the community organizations, but also with the children and their families. So we bring them on buses that we provide back to the museums on, fam on the museum on family days. The kids deliver their activities on the floor of the museum to our guests to help develop in them a sense of ownership over our institution uh, and invite their parents in, many of whom who have never been to any museum. And we want them to not only, sometimes you have to do more than just invite. You have to take the hand and show them through the door and say, this is your place, we are here to support you. This is what the intention of this set of programs. Then we have, from that, extended service learning, youth development that is all grounded in the science content, building the public speaking skills and the confidence of the youth from these organizations, and then bridging them into universities. Last year, of the approximately 100 kids that, uh, that participated in the highest level of this series of programs, the science achievers, 26 of them were seniors in high school. These are regular kids who are not screened from the Chicago Public Schools. Of those kids, every one of them ended up graduating from high school. Every one of them ended get up getting into a four-year college. And 60% of them ended up getting scholarships that we had advocated for them for and supported them in applying for. These kids need access, opportunity, and a bridge to engage in science to their full extent. And unless we build these well-structured commitments to our communities, it's not going to be enough. We have to help invite them in and hold their hands and have conversations with them about what's going to work where they are. Thank you. I'd like to add just a little bit to that. We, we, had, we have actually some, I think, very important experiences in what we've been calling a 360 degree because it's, it's, it's exactly what you suggest, that you need to go well outside, in our case of any sort of television or media approach, actually into the community and really understand how that works. Where we've had the most success is where we've had the most funding from the Department of Education, and that has to do with early literacy, because there are kids coming to school with 800 words where they should have 10,000. And so starting that kind of a problem set, how do you help parents in their homes and around their homes in every part of their lives 
use the grocery store as a way to understand language? How do you uh, show them billboards that have that invite them to to try new kinds of language learning? And you do that through all kinds of pieces of, of the community as it stands now. Obviously, uh, your best friend's older brother would be a great ambassador uh, for science or for, or for literacy. But we've had to go and we've targeted 20 specifically uh, low socioeconomic strata markets in the United States over the last two years to really experiment. <clears throat> so we've gotten the San Diego Chargers to go on the radio and, and, and television and endorse uh, and really help kids get invited. We've put billboards, we've done all kinds of alternative uh, activities, we've wrapped uh, the resource and referral vans in southern Illinois with Carbon in Carbondale with our logos and driven around showing, giving free DVDs targeted to parents. We've tried things that, that public television has never done before, but really need to be done in order to get inside the community. And by, by proving that we can make a, a difference in a few communities, we get other communities to, to pay attention, and, and therefore we play this kind of beginning role. But it really is a 360 uh, uh, approach. Thank you for the question. Um, and I have kind of two. We, uh, I just want to say we we're going to be having a vote probably in 10 minutes or less, but we never know if it's more or less. But So I just want to keep this going, but uh, if we can, I know that there are some more questions, so I just want to make, make you aware of that. And I, wa I want to hear the rest of the, the response to the question, but uh, just be aware of that. So very, very quickly. So uh, there's a line of research uh, within my field of science education that tr tries to orient to the, the expertise that children develop uh, in their life around their interests. So uh, you can think of some of the examples we've been hearing about these pockets of, of uh, expertise that kids orient to. Uh, and it, and it, it's something that teachers can orient to as well, but often they don't um, uh, kind of stop to do that. So we have a lot of uh, efforts in the, the, the curriculum to build on prior knowledge, but not to build on prior interests or developing identities of children. And so within the culturally responsive instruction approach, there are efforts to try to take the interests and particular uh, circumstances of everyday life as something to be brought kind of into a science-related uh, learning experience. So that's kind of one response. Uh, within the committee uh, report that we, we did for the NRC, uh, there are a range of partnerships that we've been hearing about uh, between science-rich institutions and communities to try to figure out how to kind of be bringing access to phenomena and engaging experiences to a broader set of populations who tend to be marginalized in school settings, uh, just from the research point of view. And those partnerships require kind of active engagement from both sides between the science-rich institution and the community representation to try to figure out how to broker the, the experience in, in relation to the local interests and needs of the communities, the ways they talk, the ways they engage in particular uh, ways of sense making, uh, to try to negotiate the design of those programs. And when that's done, learning outcomes do represent kind of growth in science knowledge and deeper participation and engagement in science related activity. Dr. Hall, quickly. Yes, with, uh, it, it's essential to engage, and in our case in Chicago, has been with community councils. We actually work with almost 11 community councils and we uh, have programs in their libraries uh, very similar to uh, what other panelists but it, it really dedicate it, it requires a lot of dedication from the councils and from us we have to actually pay for the buses for the kids to come to the zoo we actually have to engage these, these community councils we have breakfast with the with the local churches with the local ministers association we really need to engage them to get that kind of involvement uh, we believe that, for example, we have a, a, a library pass system. Every family can go to any library in the metropolitan area and check out four passes, free passes to the zoo. And those are very, very heavily used, particularly in these communities. Every cultural institution has a variation of that, and it, it really requires that very, very active engagement. Dr. Freeney Mundi. Yes, just very briefly, in addition to these wonderful and exciting uh, ways of engaging the parts of the informal science edu commun education community directly with community organizations, uh, youth serving organizations, I would underscore also the importance of the connections to the formal education community to leverage the enormous uh, knowledge base within the informal science ed community and to, to find ways to replicate at least pieces of what the school in Cleveland is able to deliver. So lunch with scientists, there are other ways that the informal science ed community connects wonderfully with schools and I think uh, emphasis on uh, playing those out more fully is another way to be sure that we're reaching broadly. 
thank uh, Ms. Fudge for her, her excellent in question. Look forward to your contribution to our subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, recognize Dr. Ehlers for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you very much. You've thrown out a lot of good ideas, and I'm very excited about about this and the progress that you've made. Uh, the, um, in particular, the point about educating the teachers, professional development, and that's why when I played quite a role in setting up the Math Science Partnership Program in the Department of Ed and a similar program in NSF. And it, it's crucial that we do this. Uh, personally, when I was still a professor, I, s I did a couple of summer institutes trying to develop new science programs in the local schools. And it became clear to me immediately uh, the, the problem is not the teachers in the sense that they're incompetent. The problem is that we have competent teachers who desperately want to teach science and math well and have never learned it themselves because they've never been taught it properly and have not been taught how to teach it properly. So thank you for uh, what you're doing on that. Uh, I just have one thing, something uh, sort of out, off the wall uh, about the, this type of education, the informal education. And we, what stimulates it, we uh, have done some work in nanotechnology legislation and there's some concerns about the social implications of nanotechnology and, and particularly the products. And uh, we heard from many groups that the general public has to be better informed on this issue. Well, I could write a long issue, a long list of things like that, you know, uh, high, high powered power lines for distribution of the grid. There's a long standing belief that somehow uh, living near one of those can cause cancer in your children. Similarly, vaccinations. There are a number of parents, a growing number of parents, who are refusing to have their children vaccinated because there's a belief out there that, the excuse, excuse me, the belief that, that somehow vaccinations cause autism. And, and yet there are other areas where things hap should happen and aren't because the public doesn't really understand it. A good example is weight and obesity. Uh, I, I just cringe at some people I see walking down the sidewalk and I can just lay out for them their life path of what it's gonna be in terms of diabetes and other diseases as a result of their weight. Uh, I think we need a lot more informal education for adults as well as for children. And uh, obviously, PBS could play a major role there. But there are a lot of other things that could happen, too, involving parents on field trips, for example, saying, we, we'd like your kids to go on this field trip. It's very, very important, but we'd really like to have you come along so that you can discuss it at home afterwards. Or you can even mask it and say, we just need you to control this bus full of kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we need, we need 15 parents to go along with these 20 kids. So I, I hope you'll uh, put that in your thinking and try to figure out some way to really educate the general public about science as well. I'd appreciate any com comments you'd care to make on that. One thing it makes me think of, um, in the report there's a chapter on media uh, that and, and it's kind of growing prevalence in different forms. Uh, and we've, Mr. Lippincott was already kind of giving us a sense of that. Um, in terms of the, the research base on what people learn from engaging media, so kind of the, uh, the broader communication of science, the, the research is pretty clear around educational television and the, the science learning that goes on uh, around that in ways that, that you can measure directly. Uh, although, uh, you know, access to other digital media, blogs, virtual spaces, and wikis, and serious games, and all these new emergent technologies, it, there's a, people are engaging with scientific information in radically new ways. Uh, and we don't necessarily understand the details of what science they're learning in those moments yet because we don't have those research literatures to, to really guide us. Uh, so that's kind of the one kind of uh, insight that the committee developed uh, related to your question, which is a really foundational, important question related to science literacy in the broadest sense. Now, if we can just people, get people to watch public television, it might help. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Farini Mundi. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. And of course, um, our programs do do invite proposals that span the range um, and, and are concerned with public understanding at all levels. One one quick example: the Nanoscale Informal Science Education Network 
uh, is, an, is a model for how it's possible with uh, partnerships of museums, laboratories, universities, and so on to bring attention to a particular topic for all age ranges, including a number of public forums based on European models for communicating and engaging the public in science. So we have several examples, and uh, I agree it's a very important area of focus. Yes, I thought I saw one other hand. Yes. Mr. I'd like to say that I, I hope we, we think we are onto something with the media that I tried to show you a little bit about. I mean, the fact that kids, not only, not only can we put it in the television programs, but you've pointed out what my daughter, my daughter has said to me, which is, Dad, if you want me to watch it, why'd you put it on public television? Uh, because she doesn't watch public television. But in fact, uh, she's 17, so that's, that's a difficult re audience to reach. But there are... Our, our, our programs do attract broad audiences, and in fact, these online services, just as Dr. Bell has said, we, we know we're doing something right, but in many cases, we don't even know yet what we're doing right. Uh, the, the, the first week that the service that I showed you last September uh, was uh, made available, we didn't even publicize it, and we had a million streams a week, and ever since then, we've had a million streams a week. Kids who are six to eight years old are coming to get information, and they're exploring it actively in a way that they can't do on television. There's something wonderful happening, but the foundational questions of what is really going on, uh, just as with television, we know they're learning. The question is, what are they learning? And we mm -hmm. really need to really understand that as prof media professionals so that we can do a better job of what you're, what you're saying. No, I totally agree. And I think you should tell your daughter that you can't give her an allowance because <laughs> not enough hard. people watch public television I'll, so you don't get paid. I'll, I'll try that. <laughs> Dr. The, the one thing we're finding is that the, the, the competition is for leisure time and how science can become an active, uh, how people can be active practitioners. One of the things uh, to consume science information is different than practicing science. One of the issues that we're facing, facing is not enough time outside um, no, uh, the initiative, no, no child left in, uh, inside. The issue of, of uh, not, this is the most sedentary generation, and we're finding linkages between um, overweight, uh, attention deficit disorder, and enough time being uh, outside and exploring nature. The fact that you as a farm boy were doing with your animals and so on is an experience that almost no children uh, have these days. So we believe that one of the main issues for scientific discovery is by scientific discovery by itself and actually promoting, uh, promoting more time exploring science as active actors. It can be in the classroom, it can be, but informal settings are unique to provide that experience. So that partnership between being active players of science instead of passive consumers is a really relevant issue here for formal and informal education. Yeah. Ms. Ingram, you get a chance to close it out. Just briefly, we recognize families are critical to whether or not children are going to excel and continue on in their, their sense of wonder and inspiration in science. We talk a lot about youth and how to engage because it's a particular problem that exists um, in advancing science education for our students in K through 8. But families need to be integrated. We need to, when we build our ex exhibitions, we make sure they're accessible for our youth, but they're really designed for the whole family so that they can talk together. It inspires conversation amongst them. It's not a singular experience. It's a shared communal experience. And every, all of the community initiatives we talked about earlier, Family days programs are, need to be embedded in all of that. We truly have to have this be something that the family understands is an opportunity for their youth and an opportunity for them to participate in. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are uh, about seven minutes left in the vote, although I think we might have a little more time than that because not many members have gotten down there. But I just wanted to, uh, one thing I, I was going to ask, I'm just going to throw out, out there there quickly. Uh, Dr. Freeman Monday had talked about the nanoscale informal science education network initiative. Um, I'm not going to ask you to do it here because of the lack of time, but I, I would certainly like to hear more uh, about that and how it was uh, developed and the ongoing work with, with that because I really am a strong supporter and I really believe, I've said many times here, I've drunk the Kool-Aid and believe uh, nanotechnology is the uh, next industrial revolution. I truly believe that, and I think it's something that people have to be educated uh, more about. But uh, I want to thank all the witnesses for, uh, for the, their testimony today. Um, I had mentioned how I had, 
uh, always been excited by uh, science engineering, uh, going to the uh, Museum of Science and Industry. I certainly watched uh, PBS uh, an awful lot. Prob I probably wouldn't better off if I watched more, maybe. Uh, <laughs> and I was a member of the uh, Brookfield Zoo uh, when, I, when I was a kid and spent a lot of time there at, at the zoo and, and learned a lot there. Um, so I appreciate very much the importance of informal science education. I think we need to keep, continue to do more. Uh, it's good to hear your, your testimony, uh, but to anything uh, further down the line that you can recommend to us uh, that we can do here on the federal level to help uh, with this, uh, we certainly do want, do want to hear from you. And I just want to say the record will re remain open for additional statements from the members and for answers to any follow-up questions the committee may ask of, of the witnesses. And uh, with that, uh, the witnesses are excused and the hearing is now adjourned. <laughs>